Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll see a story that we've edited for the North Dakota Council on the Arts. But first, joining me now is Chuck Fleming, author of Carlisle Township to the Capital City, A Lifetime of Memories. Chuck, thanks so much for joining us Great today. Great to be here. Before we get into the book, let's start off with, tell, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, maybe where you're originally from. I was born in Grafton, North Dakota and was raised in a little, near a little town called Hamilton in Pamina County uh, on, a, on a farm three miles south and two miles east. Graduated from Hamilton High School and then off to North Dakota State University with a degree uh, in agricultural economics. Then off to the Army, back home, eventually going back home to Pamina County to farm on our family farm. Hmm. Okay. Well, now, obviously we're going to get more into some of your, your escapades throughout your life, I guess, there. But what made you decide to write a book? Well, I thought about my ancestors that came over from Scotland and Canada and in, in homesteaded in, in uh, northeastern North Dakota and what little I knew about them. Um, my, I never knew my great-grandparents. I only knew my one uh, grandmother, and she died when I was eight years old. Uh, there's many, many stories I would like to hear, uh, would like to have known about them. And I decided for my grandchild I have and more I hope to have in the future that they ought to know a little bit more about their ancestry. Well, with that said, so, well, you jumped down to one of my questions. So you did, you wrote it in part then for your grandchildren, great grandchildren. So you wanted this to carry on That's for, right. for future generations. I think uh, this book will be much more interesting 50 and 100 years from now <laughs> than it is today. Uh, it's not written for the general public, although because of my activity in government and politics, there's certainly some people that will be interested in it. But my primary target was for future generations. Okay, and we're going to get into some of that. Uh, you know, you sort of have you've had an eventful career in the public eye. But let's start back on the family farm. What was it like growing up during that during that time? Well, I always said that I think I lived in the best country in the world, and probably the best part of that country, living up in northeastern North Dakota, small town. When I was growing up, our town, which was five miles from the farm, was 241 population. It's since declined. And so we were just typical small farmers. I have two brothers uh, in, on the, uh, that grew up with me and my father and mother, um, both with backgrounds in agriculture. And so uh, I guess I was just a typical uh, kid growing up in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, can you talk about how you first got elected to the North Dakota legislature? It is kind of an interesting story. I'd, I'd been at NDSU and then off two years in the Army and then in April of 1970, I went back home to farm. So I hadn't really been home since my high school days, uh, but uh, was fairly well known. In July, uh, this Democratic Party district chairman uh, uh, ran into him and I asked him when we were gonna have a uh, district convention to nominate candidates for the legislature. And he said, Chuck, he says, I, I, I don't think we're gonna have one. Nobody wants to run. And I said, well, maybe I would. The long story short is he called a convention. There were five people there, including my father. And that was the beginning of my elected political career. <laughs> okay. Well, then also, because maybe uh, you can talk some about how your, the years you were involved with the governor center, uh, and, and I guess you were his campaign manager and then chief of staff. That's correct. Um, back in May of 1983, um, I, I was work, working out of Bismarck uh, there for a business meeting and I called home and my wife said that Bud Sinner wanted to talk to you right away. Give him a call, collect. Well, I'd known Bud Sinner for a long time. Uh, he'd run for Congress and I remember the first time I met him back in 1963 when he first ran for Congress and didn't get the nomination. And I said, well, I'm not going to call him back, collect. So I was in a hotel and I just dialed up through the through the uh, switchboard at the o uh, operator, and uh, we had what ended up being a 58-minute conversation. The cost of that phone call was worth more than what it cost me to spend the night at that hotel. <laughs> and we talked about him running, uh, that he was going to run for governor, which was no surprise to me, but he was looking for somebody to put this all together. And uh, I told him, I have to think about this. I've got a lot of other things on my plate, and I'm not sure. So. I deferred for a while and thought about it and eventually I became, for six months, was a volunteer and after that, when we had to get serious, we put together a staff to first of all win the nomination, which is a difficult journey, 
and then of course go on and take on an incumbent governor. Well, can, can you talk about some of the achievements? I mean, uh, you know, some of those years were marked with student out migration and, and farm foreclosures, but, but also good things happened as well. So can you t talk about some of those things? Well, it was the worst of times when we came in, uh, quite frankly. Uh, the budget that the governor, Alan Olson, had put together was, uh, was no longer workable. Things have slid that far in, in commodity prices and oil prices. And so we had to redo a budget, and we had to do allotments of, uh, in future years of the state party or state uh, general fund budget. And so it was a very difficult time. Those early days, uh, the farm crisis was unbelievable. Uh, we, had, uh, we had so many businesses that were in default on their loans, and uh, Steiger Tractor was in trouble here in Fargo. They were just a difficult time. So we spent a great deal of time in the early going trying to fix things, quite frankly. And the ag crises was one of the major things we worked on and finally eventually figured out a system to keep farmers on the land. Mm -hmm. and, and with some of that said, you know, look at the differences of those years and now with, with what's going on in the oil industry and in, in the commodities and things and beef industry, at, at times just ebb and flow, don't they? Well, us, us liberals would have loved to be in charge of the government in today's date. In, uh, in our days, we were, we were working how to keep how to keep educational funding at a level we always couldn't keep it at, at the level we liked and so it was it was some very difficult and challenging times I sort of scoff at the idea of those people that now in government say gee when you have so much money it's harder than when you don't have any that's not true because it's it's so difficult to pick the priorities when you're in, in very difficult financial straits so we had we spent a lot of time uh, just trying to get the economy in North Dakota back on track. Well, uh, I've been told, of course, that, that you're the father of gaming. Can you tell us how that came about and why that is? <laughs> uh, I served in the legislature for 10 years. I was elected five times from, from uh, District 11 in the northeast corner of the state, uh, first elected age 25. And in 1975, uh, I introduced a constitutional amendment that would allow gaming in North Dakota. We had a total constitutional ban. And so one of the problems was that there were still these smokers, as they called them, going on at legion clubs and fraternal organizations that were illegal. My brother was state's attorney in Pamina County, and of course, they'd ask him, is this okay to do? And he had to say no. And, and it was difficult. If he closed them down, you'd never get reelected, and yet people wanted to do such things. So I decided, if we're not going to enforce the law, let's fix it. And so the decision I had to make was whether I open up gaming for everybody, like Las Vegas style, or go just for nonprofit, educational, and charitable organizations where the profits would go to them. And I opt for the latter because I thought that was much more feasible to get passed. And so I introduced the Constitutional Amendment in 1975 in my third session. Um, I was surprised to support. I got over 70 votes in the House. Senate was a little tougher, but we got the constitutional amendment then on the ballot because if the House and Senate pass it, then it goes to the voters in the next general election. The good news was the governor didn't need to sign it because Governor Link at that time was governor and he probably would have vetoed it. But uh, so it got on the ballot in the, in, the, in the next year in 1976 and overwhelmingly, I think like 93,000 to 38,000, it passed. And so since that time, millions of dollars have gone into public-spirited organizations because of it. And I was the only one that sponsored it. I didn't want to burden other fellow legislators with that because I didn't know politically whether they'd like it or not uh, and how it would affect their election. But, of course, I wasn't worried about that. But in the end, it proved to be very popular and still is today. Well, many nonprofits owe, owe you a big thank you for that. Uh, again, some other stories that... but. I've only heard about it a little bit. You have a story about Fidel Castro. Those are the days I worked in the North Dakota Ag Department. Uh, I, I started working at North Dakota Department of Agriculture for, in 2001 and worked there for uh, about a dozen years uh, to end my career. And one of the big pushes was by Commissioner Roger Johnson was to get uh, trade with Cuba. Now, there's some very tough restrictions on getting trade. It's mostly for food and medical supplies. And thank goodness for President Obama's trying to change that. And I think that's appropriate to do. In the end, um, with the efforts of the commissioner, um, uh, we had over $35 million in, in sales. But so we had, I made three trips over there myself. And um, 
we had the opportunity, of course, to meet with uh, President Castro, and <clears throat> there was one interesting meeting. Uh, the man is, is a brilliant man, uh, and he understands his people, and he understands how it, what it takes to feed his people. But anyway, we were in a meeting with about nine people. There was some, two people from Iowa, two from Alabama, the commissioner and I, and his interpreter and bodyguard there, and it's a very small meeting. And he, he started talking how he wanted to change the sugar production in Cuba and change it over to citrus fruits because citrus fruits was, uh, was uh, a greater revenue source than, than the sugar. And he wanted, then went on and on and on about how he wanted to trade sugar uh, and buy United States sugar. Well, I, I, we had met with him several times before in larger groups. And when he starts talking, he doesn't know when to quit, quite frankly. And he was going on and on. And when he took a deep breath, I, I said, Mr. President, how much are you willing to pay? <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me, and even though he understands English, he always runs everything through his interpreter. And he said, world price. And I just couldn't help but break out laughing. Because at that time, our sugar beet farmers in Red River Valley were getting 20 cents a pound, and he was going to pay world price, which is a nickel. Well, he wasn't going to buy any sugar from the United States for a nickel. So that was my one experience with... Uh, with, with the president. I'm just glad that the bodyguard that he had with him had a sense of humor. <laughs> well, that's the Fidel Castro story. Now, what about Bill Clinton? I understand you've got a story or two there. Oh, there's lots of stories about Bill Clinton. He's, uh, he was a very popular governor when Governor Sinner, and they became very close friends. And uh, uh, there's, oh, well, there's many stories, but a couple of them. Uh, in the summer meetings, uh, and this was in Cincinnati of the Governors Association, it's more informal. They have they have socials at night. Well, that was the year that Bill Clinton turned 40 years old, and he had his friends of Bill, FOBs they used to call them, and they were all there from Arkansas as well as all the governors. And it was a Dick Clark night where they had entertainment with Freddie Fender and Hermits Hermits and all of those people. Uh, and I was out dancing with my then I think. Uh, 10-year-old daughter on the dance floor. And um, all of a sudden, I get a tap on the shoulder, and here's Bill Clinton wanting to dance with my daughter. <laughs> well, of course, I allowed that to happen. <laughs> and, and then uh, the 3M company has a representative that comes to all these national governor's meetings. And uh, his, his job for the company is to take thousands of pictures and then sends them to the governor's office. That's their public relations. Now, what he did, uh, he was busy dancing on the floor, but I interrupted him. He dug out the camera in time, and now I have a picture of my daughter dancing with the future president of the United States. So that's one, just one story about Bill Clinton. Well, all right. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear more, but we, do, we need to move on. Okay. Uh, why do you think it's so difficult for the Democratic Party to gain any traction uh, like it was in, in the center years uh, today? Well, I think there's probably s several reasons. Uh, some of the, the old folks say that uh, uh, in North Dakota, the people turn to the Democrats only in times of trouble, when they need government, as the party, Democratic parties look more as, as people that are willing to do more through the governmental structure. And I think when times are good, they're more likely to vote uh, Republican. Um, but I also think it has to do with the, uh, is how well the political party is organized, how potential candidates uh, get their name known. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, for new candidates to get traction. And so uh, more work needs to be done of developing uh, uh, quality candidates that can be committed to the time. And, and the Democrats, uh, for the most part, have always been uh, short on, on the financing that's required. So there's a lot of things, but organizationally, there's some things that ought to happen too. Mm -hmm. I, I've got a lot of questions here. You also write about being president of the Pembina, Pembina County Fair, and you know, what's that about? Well, the Pembina County Fair is the oldest continuous fair in North Dakota. My, both my grandparents were on the board, my dad was on the board for 47 years, my brother's been president, my nephew's been president, and I was president for two years following my father's death, and, and at that time, some major restructuring needed to, to be done, and we modernized and did a lot of things in a couple of years to to get the fair, which is now in its 121st or 122nd year. Hmm. And you're president of the Carlisle Cereal Company. What about that? Well, I uh, uh, finished up my work as chief of staff for Governor Sinner in 1992. Of course, I had to make a real living. Uh, and sometime in June or so of, of uh, 1992, 
I walked into Lieutenant Governor Lloyd Omdahl's office, and here he, his picture was on a box of Wheaties. And I said, Lloyd, I said, I know you were pretty good at softball, but you're not that good. <laughs> I said, how'd you get this? He said, well, he said, we're in Minneapolis at the, at the National uh, Lieutenant Governor's Conference, and General Mills gave each of us a box with our own personal picture. Well, my entrepreneurial mind started twirling, and I thought, you know, there might be ability to develop a product like this where you could put people on and it would, it would sell. And as I developed that idea, I said, well, who, who would be on it? Uh, and we started talking about ball teams and kids and high school uh, concert uh, uh, choirs and so forth. And as a result of that, when I left the governor's office in uh, 1993, I started the Carlisle Cereal Company, named after the township where I was raised. Hmm. Well, interesting. And we called our product Hometown Stars. Hometown Stars. Well, you've also been a race, uh, a horse racing commentator. Well, you fall into that. Uh, uh, you fall into that when you when you're a product of the Pemina County Fair. <laughs> okay. My dad was president of the uh, of the fair at the time, and uh, the uh, uh, we had the only harness racing in North Dakota, and we're proud of that, and and had that until 2008. But when I got back from the service, the, the announcer that made the, the route for many years had passed on, and Dad had taken over that job. Well, as also being president of the fair board. Well, one year he said, Chuck, said, it's time for you to take over. So here I go and start announcing uh, the harness racing there and did that for some 20 years, which I really enjoyed. And also uh, uh, on occasion or two got to make some other, uh, be the commentator at other fairs around the area. So it was, it's kind of a fun experience. Uh, well, I said when we started, you had an eventful career. That's right. Uh, not just in politics, but with all these other things. Uh, where were you stationed in the Army? You mentioned that a few times. You were in the Army in the I, 60s. Yes, I was, I, was, uh, 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 I was an ROTC graduate at NDSU, and uh, I then ended up spending 17 months uh, over in Bremerhaven, Germany, uh, as an Army officer in the Signal Corps. It's rather ironic. Uh, I was single at the time, and they sent me to Germany, and my older brother, um, who was married, they sent him to Vietnam. And one of my duties after I got back, before he got back, was, was taking his wife to the hospital to have his second son born while he was in Vietnam. But that's, it was, it was a great experience um, um, in terms of learning organizational structure and leadership by, uh, by serving as an adjutant for a signal battalion. We're about to run out of time, but what is it that makes North Dakota a great place to live? And I believe you, you're going to read us an excerpt of a poem you've written, or you wrote years ago. Uh, yes, when I, uh, when I left for the Army, getting in an airplane for the first time, uh, in, in a melancholy mood, I decided, just came to me to start writing about what was happening. And in that, uh, uh, in, in that poem, I start talking about... Um, uh, what I saw as I looked out the window, the uh, the uh, the uh, the green the green wheat and 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 the potato fields, the roll crops, and so forth, and I describe how beautiful that was. But then, I I just said as I was tired, I said, but I couldn't help but keep looking down as I continued on my ride. This I knew was North Dakota, and I was bursting up there with pride. I thought that this was all about, all about the reason I had to go to protect this wonderful land from those who are our foe. But then I stopped a moment to think. It wasn't that at all. It was the people, not the land, that really mattered after all. And I go in for about 25 verses of that, uh, and it sort of, sort of, was the feeling I had as I was going away for the first time. Well, Chuck, we are out of time. But if people would like a copy of your book or find out more information, where can they go? It's a self-published book. You need to contact me at chuck at hometownstars.com. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much for joining us My today. pleasure. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. The North Dakota Council on the Arts is a wonderful organization that promotes the arts and artists in North Dakota. Recently, Prairie Public edited a video for the North Dakota Council on the Arts for them to show state lawmakers, accentuating the value of arts in communities. Arts and culture help define what it is that we are here in North Dakota. So having 
um, arts programming within this rural area is so important. It's important not only to the artists but to the people that are here. Just because we live in a rural area doesn't mean that we don't deserve wonderful cultural programs. The Council on the Arts provides funding for people like me to get my music out to the public. Well, I grew up doing music here in Western North Dakota. Being a rural musician can have its challenges and was always told that you should go on and go to Nashville and move out of this place and go on and, and do something with your music and somewhere else as if that meant that you were on some level a different sort of success. But I always had such a tie to this area, singing about what it was like to grow up out here, that it was always important for me to keep that sense of place but also really important for me to move back here because I wanted to be here and figure out a way to make music here and be a successful musician in the place where I wanted to live, where my family is, where my roots are. The Red Door Art Gallery is an economic engine for downtown Wahpeton. Since it started, we've had lots of special events and it's been an anchor for downtown. It's a center for our historical and cultural district. It's spurred a lot of interest in other activities in Wahpeton. It's brought a lot of federal funding into our city. We've got National Endowment of the Arts grant funding that have supported murals and, and other projects in, in Wahpeton. Prairie Rose Carousel is one of 150 restored antique carousels in, in the country. It annually gets about 20,000 riders a year, and its renovation was done completely by local artists. I think arts encourage creativity and support entrepreneurs. It needs to be a hub for young people who want to live here. It also supports downtown apartments and, and people who live here that can be stable sources for businesses up and down Main Street. We never really know what's coming up next when it comes to what our students need to be prepared for and the creativity that we get out of the students when they don't feel like there's defined measure. They don't have to have the right answer, but they do have to support why they did what they did. They still have to say, well, I did this because, and that's, that's a really important skill. I've been really involved in the Arts Council. My first step was participating in a SALT team on my first year of teaching and now it's become a STEAM team. It's a professional development three-year program specifically for teachers. The other thing that got me going was teacher incentive grants. I wrote three teacher incentive grants to get supplies into my classroom so that my students could use the high quality watercolors and brushes that we wouldn't have otherwise. In 2009, we became a part of Art for Life, and consecutive artists have come several years. They have uh, noticed an increase in how the residents respond when they come. At first, they complained they couldn't do things, and now they are doing original projects. Today, we're working with third graders, and this is a new component. The third graders are coming monthly to interact with residents, maybe eventually sharing stories and becoming pen pals and having a special resident that's here. There's definitely a positive demeanor, and if an artist is staying in Langdon, then they spend quite a bit of time here, and they paint or do something, and the residents just flock around them and interact and tell stories, so it definitely adds a healthy aspect to their day. Over the years I've had the opportunity to uh, share some of our cultural stories here in this very Earth Lodge. But as a storyteller, it's also good to share our stories with those people uh, outside of our community and outside of our state. And the Cards Council has been generous in their gifting of the funds to help myself and several others as we travel around North Dakota, as we travel across our state, even overseas. 
the young people that uh, now who have been inspired by what they've learned in our classes from flute making and singing. It's really good what the Arts Council can do to help other people. As far as myself and my family, it's been a blessing. Long ago, they had to come to the storyteller and to the lodges like this or to a home. And uh, now, with the Arts Council, I get to go to their lodges, I go to their schools, I go to their communities. We're still welcoming the pilgrims to this land from all over the world and the Arts Council helps us to uh, open those doors and to make it a lot easier to understand other people. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>